visitors from outer space, crash land without warning, and can lie buried for thousands of years. Oh my God! Jeff Notkin and Steve Arnold live to unearth these space rocks. Oh, that sounds really good. Their quest is part science. 4.56 billion years ago. And part treasure hunt. You found one? Yeah! They're the meteorite men. This is great! On this adventure, the guys head to the Great White North, Canada, for two very different hunts. Woo! After a fireball is caught on tape. Big explosion and it's all over. Jeff and Steve head to the site to hunt space rocks worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. These meteorites are like lumps of gold. Then, science separates the forest from the trees. And that just virtually strips away all the vegetation. Revealing a new crater and virgin hunting grounds. You found one already? Wow. But these rare meteorites come at a price. Oh, no! Here in Canada, it's about 50 degrees colder than we expected. The forecast said it was going to be warm, and we needed to get up here before the snow came, and the snow beat us here. There's no two ways about it. I've lost my mind completely. Jeff Notkin and Steve Arnold are in the prairie lands of Saskatchewan, Canada, to hunt for pieces of a rare meteorite. This is great! The guys know there are space rocks here, because this fall is one of only a handful to be caught on tape. Those fireball videos just blow my mind. Just after sunset on November 20th, 2008, a vast stretch of Canada is lit up by a fireball five times brighter than a full moon. There was a police video that captured this thing coming in, and it was pretty phenomenal. This thing tears through our atmosphere from space, explodes right in front of the car, and they get this drop-dead fantastic video. The space rock, about the size of a desk weighing 10 tons, hits the atmosphere faster than 31,000 miles per hour. When you see one of those videos, you go, oh my god, they travel really fast. I know in the intellectual part of my brain that meteors hit the atmosphere at many, many thousands of miles an hour, but that's just a number. When you see that video, and it only lasts about a second from infinity to here, big explosion and it's all over. Scientists immediately collect the amazing videos, map the locations they were shot from, and triangulate the landing zone of the fireball. The data points to a big target in western Saskatchewan, but now they have to find the bullseye. Meteorite hounds, academics, and the curious scour the Canadian prairie. One week later, 180 miles east of Edmonton, a discovery. It wasn't a big lake. Spotted something black out there on the ice, and the first one was found. We have the very first piece of the meteorite that was recovered from the fireball last Thursday. People think meteorites, when they come in, they're on fire, thanks to Hollywood. It's far more dramatic if you have a fireball coming in, and it hits the ground, and it blows up buildings. Nothing could be further from the truth. The thing burns out miles up in the air. You see from the fireball video, it's, it's only a second or two of a fire. Uh, just enough to, to, to toast the outside of the rock. And then you've, it's got a minute or two or three or four minutes of free fall. In November in Canada, it's, you know, and it hits a frozen lake. It, it's a cold rock hitting a cold lake. The meteorite fall is named after the area where the pieces are found, Buzzard Coulee. The largest piece recovered is this monster, weighing in at 13 kilograms, nearly 29 pounds. To buy a space rock of this size, a private collector would have to shell out about $400,000. Effectively, these meteorites are like lumps of gold, the same kind of value. The Buzzer Cooley meteorite is an H4 chondrite. So it's a meteorite that contains chondrules, which were the first materials to form in the solar nebula. 
They're usually um, millimeter size. They're quite small to a fraction of a millimeter. If we were to cut open one of those stones, we'd see those little chondrules in there that are older than Earth, older than the solar system. It kind of makes you feel small. <laughs> a $400,000 space rock gets everyone's attention. The guys hear about the meteorite frenzy going on up in Canada while on another expedition. It was a real big deal. Big deal in Canada, big, big deal worldwide, definitely a big deal in the, in the meteorite world. Amateur meteorite hunters recover about 110 pounds of specimens in a week, and there's no end in sight. Buzzard Cooley, the locals were really into it. They were very interested. It was absolutely great. But winter is fast approaching, and when the harsh weather blows in, the hunters get blown out. You just can't hunt for meteorites in the snow, not these little stones. And we can't hunt when the crops are there. The farmers won't let us on their land, understandably. So we had a very narrow window during which we could hunt. Nearly a year after the fireball lit up the sky, Steve and Jeff finally arrive at search location number one, a cold and snowy location number one. We should call it the snow field, not the strewn field. It is. The buzzard coulee meteorites found so far outline a strewn field, the area where the meteorites fell, about six miles long and two miles wide. Location number one is right in the heart of it. My concern is that we're looking for small stone meteorites in the snow in stubble. Yeah, my, my concern is we're going to freeze. <laughs> well, that's a given. Well, let's get going. We're burning daylight. You sure you want to do this? You know how long you've been waiting to get up here? <laughs> and a little frostbite isn't going to stop me. OK, see you later. I am not ready yet. Something about Stevie's very speedy, really anxious to get out in the field. Be looking for a, a little, just a ping, very distinct. The meteorites that we're looking for in this section of the strewn field are, are, are quite small. I would say. Sounds like junk. Marble-sized. Farm junk. A little bit bigger, if we're lucky. With the snow on the ground, there's not much chance of seeing them. Got the first meteor wrong! So he's yelling at me already about something he hasn't found. I don't even know what that is. I'm going to wear headphones connected to the detector. I can hear a fainter signal. And also, they block out the sound of Steve yelling at me every time he finds something that's not a meteorite. So I've got a double purpose there. <gasps> Buzzard Cooley meteorites are classified as stone, but they contain some iron. Ooh. The guys use high-tech metal detectors. It could be a big one. And a low-tech metal stick, re-engineered for meteorite hunting. Stick a rare earth magnet, duct tape it to the end of it, and a rare earth magnet's going to be probably 10 times stronger than your refrigerator magnet, strong enough that it's going to pick up a meteorite that's got any iron in it. This reaches down. If it picks it up, that's pretty conclusive for a field test. The treasured meteorites are black, but so are some earth rocks, and the magnet test is not infallible. This is so wrong. Look at this. It's a little piece of granite. It's got enough iron in there that it sticks to the magnet, and it makes your heart jump. And then it's just this stupid cosmic joke. <laughs> You, you have to have a real positive attitude. It's almost like losing your keys. You know you lost them in the yard, and you're, you're looking for them. We knew they were there. We were looking for them. We're expecting it. Oh, man. There have got to be pieces. Might be able to see them. Might be able to see them. Just because we encounter adversity when we're in the field doesn't mean we're going to stop. This is a crazy, difficult, challenging, weird, and sometimes frightening business to be in. Location number one turns out to be a bust, but the guys have heard about big meteorites found nearby. Before they can hunt this new area, they need permission from the owner of the farmland. Hi, big doggy. The good news is the farmer is a collector, too. I'll show you the bigger one. Look at that. 
the hired man actually for your phone. And he works. Yeah, he, he works, works on the land yeah. for you. Yeah, it's like a Star Trek envelope. <laughs> well, congratulations. That's yeah. a, that's a beautiful stone and quite valuable. And the value is what? A couple thousand. Yeah, I would say. Yeah. At least. We'd like to ask permission to walk the property from you, if that's OK. So well, that's see fine. if we're able to locate anything. Well, thank Thanks you. a lot. Location number two is within spitting distance of the small lake where the first meteorite was found. The famous lake. This is it. The fireball would have come right over here. And boom, that's where the very first pieces were found on the frozen lake. It's well, I, I have a theory. That if oh, we, good. If, if we're moving, we're going to stay warmer. I like so, that. So come on, Jeff. I can work with that. Sometimes it doesn't hurt to get a little lucky. Nah, it's more buried trash. Um, um, I think I got one. <gasps> yeah! Oh, he's too far away. Oh, man. <laughs> Look at this. Wow. So this is my first buzzard. Oh, that's so cute. This is probably going to be worth 20 or $30 a gram. So two to $300. This is cool. This is so cool. Makes the whole trip worth it. With Steve's first meteorite in the bag, Jeff's competitive spirit kicks in. But so far, there's a whole lot of cold and just one small meteorite. Oh, this is hard going in here. Ah! Oh, that's so mean. That's... I thought it was the real thing because it looks so black on the outside, but it's an earth rock. It's not magnetic enough. Damn it. I'm a little worried about Jeff. It's bloody ridiculous. We just don't really have much chance of finding tiny black rocks mixed in with snow and all of this damn whatever it is. Not that I'm annoyed or anything. Just as Jeff hits a wall, Steve's perseverance pays off. There's one. <laughs> OK, cool. This is like maybe about 15 grams, 16 grams. Not a completely crusted one. What we'll call one that it's 100% crusted means that the entire surface has a burnt fusion crust, like, like crust on a loaf of bread. So $20, $30 a gram, you know, this is like uh, $300 maybe. So hey, haven't paid for the airplane ticket yet, but we're getting there. With two buzzard coolie finds, Steve now has about $500 worth of meteorites in his pocket. Jeff is cold and on a cold streak. I might as well just randomly try and throw my magnet cane and harpoon meteorites for all the good it's doing. I've been through this process many times, that I hunt and I don't find anything, and I get increasingly irrit irritable and frustrated and occasionally even take it out on Steve. How can there not be anything here? It doesn't make any sense. They're here. Just have to find them. Oh, thank you. Gee, if only I thought of that. I'm so stupid. I hate it here. Not that I'm angry or anything. It's very expensive to mount these expeditions. It's tiring, it's frustrating. But I think you have to be slightly mad to do it. No, this is crazy. Damn it. Just when he's about to cash it in, Jeff gets the break he needs. Ah! That's it. Excellent. That is definitely the real thing. A real meteorite. And it's oriented as well. That means that it, it acquired a, a, a shape reminiscent of a shield. When it traveled through the Earth's atmosphere, the, the front of it melted, leaving a rounded front and a flat back. Oriented meteorites are quite rare, and that is a, a feature that we only see in space rocks. It's only little, but it's really cool. <laughs> Find number three. Weighing just under 28 grams, Jeff's meteorite is worth a cool $1,000. We get the chance to see one of these fireball videos and then go and find the rock. And you hold the rock and you look at the video and you go, oh my god, this comes from that. It's an encounter with existence outside of our own world. No doubt that that is the real thing. 
Whew. And my hand's so cold after one minute without the glove. Up here in Canada, finding the space rocks is just half the battle. We can't just take these home. We'd love to. Meteorites are the cultural property of the Canadian government, and that just adds to the guy's frustrations. It was made very clear to us that we're allowed to keep what we find, but we're not allowed to take it out of the country without an export permit. So we have to play the game. We have to respect the rules the way they're set in this country where we're guests. Steve and Jeff continue their frigid hunt. This is brutal out here. <sighs> the weather is dangerously cold and getting colder. The only way to keep warm is to keep moving. It really annoys me when these earth rocks stick to the magnet. I know. The tough decision to continue the hunt despite the cold and red tape turns out to be a wise one. Just a short distance from find number three. You want to see something cool? Jeff spots a rock that stands out. Look at that right there. See how that's bluish black and red compared to everything else around here? Now watch this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Wow. So perseverance pays off sometimes, even in the most adverse conditions. It's horrible out here. My brain is beginning to freeze. <sighs> even after a fourth find, Jeff realizes discretion is the better part of valor. It's time to retreat. It was just so cold. It wasn't a question of it's uncomfortable, we shouldn't really do it. It was just dangerous. It must be 12 degrees, and we're out here hunting for these rocks with magnets on the ends of sticks, which is completely mad. Come on, get in the truck. I'm out of here. <clears throat> Day one, the guys found four beautiful pieces, alien visitors that dropped in on Canada, worth upwards of $1,500. Day two. The guys wake up to even colder temperatures. This expedition to Buzzard was easily the coldest weather in which I have ever hunted for meteorites or possibly ever done anything at all. I'm not one to normally complain, but it's biting cold. Freezing or not, they have to hunt now because in the spring, the crops will be planted and the fields will be off limits. There's a nasty looking snow front moving in as well, I think. For the second day, the guys are back at location number two. They've moved to a neighboring wheat field they think hasn't been picked over yet. Talking with some of the neighbors, it's it's like they've been found on all this all around us. Their hunch pays off. Woo! Steve! Oh yeah. We we're right to check out this field. It's a beautiful fusion crusted stone, really well preserved, nice black crusts. Nice. I found one. Jeff! You found one? I found one. Excellent. That's two in 10 minutes. This is what we want. No question about it. How big is it? 10 grams. Cool. Yeah, that's about the size of this one. Oh, nice. Oh, that's really nice. Well, let's see if we wow. can pull out a few more. Just as quickly as it pays off, Location number two dries up. <laughs> Jeff and Steve need a fresh lead. Good intel can be worth its weight in meteorites, so the guys head to the southern end of the strewn field to share secrets with Jim and Loretta Mitchell. Hello, how are you, how are you guys? It's cold, it's cold. The Mitchells may be able to point the guys to some hefty space rocks. And here's my little little CD there. I think it's 55 grams. That's not little. <laughs> Loretta's most valuable buzzard coolie find is this 423 gram beauty. At almost a pound, it's worth about $10,000. Would you like to hold this? May we? That is spectacular. Actually found on the road. Yeah, down by the fish pond. That's pretty cool. There might be some little pieces still. Jeff and Steve's search for valuable pieces of the buzzard coolie meteorite has led them to the number one eyewitness. Came right from over about here and went down kind of an angle. It, it went right over your head. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. something. Don Shipowich saw the fireball explode. And one piece he collected is worth thousands of dollars more, not because of its size, but because of where it hit. You had one hit one of your buildings? Yes. Yeah. Wow. OK. I found one that came off the roof. 
Uh, they call it a hammerstone these days. That's say. right, you know yeah. the terminology. Yeah. So where is yeah. that stone now? At my mother's. You gave it to her? Yeah, I gave it Aren't to her. Aren't you sweet? Yeah. Do you know how rare that is in, in, in no. the scheme of things? We have only a handful of recorded instances ever in North America of, oh. of things being hit by meteorites. Yeah. Have you been up on the ladder to check to see if there's an impact no. crater up there? <laughs> no. I... Well, if there was, the, the piece of metal would be worth money, too. Oh, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Would it? A hammerstone impact can be a real windfall. In 1992, this Chevy Malibu was worth maybe a couple of hundred bucks. But on the night of October 9th, a fireball streaked over Peekskill, New York, and a 27-pound meteorite punched a hole in the Malibu's trunk. The celestial fender bender turned the beater into a collectible, offered for sale at $100,000. The meteorite Malibu is still making money today. It's been on tour around the world. Thousands of people line up to see the car whose trunk was caved in by a visitor from outer space. With just a couple of hours left in the day, the guys head to location number three near the frozen pond where Loretta found her $10,000 meteorite. Even if it's hard going, we gotta, we gotta put in a bit more time here. Oh, that's more like it! Steve! Don't tell me. Oh, wow. That's more like it. Look at this beauty. Wow. Ah, the cash value on this would probably be 500. Yeah, this is starting to add up. Oh, yes. The guys now have okay, eight okay. meteorites worth thousands of dollars. With only an hour of daylight left, Steve has devised a plan for mechanized gridding. Scientifically speaking, it's trolling with magnets. Why don't you run the truck? I'll ride on the tailgate. You keep warm for a little bit. I'm going to look out the back. Hey, this might work. And then maybe we'll take turns. Stop! No. OK, go. Stop. No. Go. Stop. No. OK, go. You're not driving over, Annie. What's he complaining about now? Oh, stop. No. OK, go. I could walk faster than this. I am convinced that had he driven over a meteorite, I would have seen it. And I, I didn't drive over a meteorite, so it's my fault that he didn't find any using this harebrained scheme of his. Go a little slower if you can. Yeah, well, not that slow. The irritating part for me is I was driving and not getting to do anything except drive, and he was sitting on the back going, stop, stop, stop. Oh, there's nothing. OK, go, stop. And then I eventually just had a meltdown. I really can't stand any more of this. This is ridiculous. But I'm done. Ah! It's a complete failure. So we won't do that again. OK, the whole trip was worth it just to watch you uh, blow a gasket. Thank you. Yeah. Frozen out of Buzzard Coulee, the guys take their eight meteorites and head to the University of Alberta, a center for meteoritic studies in Edmonton, where scientists are eager to get their hands on them. That's a pretty good haul. Chris Hurd studies the individual chondrules inside the meteorites with a million dollar electron scanning microprobe. This chondrule is only about twice the width of a human hair. They're out there in the solar system, the very beginning of the solar system. They're molten droplets. They each form crystals under different conditions. And then they all come together in this rock, right? And so you have this sampling, like this grab bag of the solar system, you know, that part of the solar system all put together. It's a grab bag of these, of these little tiny pieces yeah. from the early days of the solar system, the beginning of the solar system. That's very poetic. It's, it's beautiful. Steve and Jeff know their rocks are H4 chondrites, but for a scientific look at them, they enlist the help of meteoriticist Aaron Walton. These are beautiful pieces. It's not a contest, but mine are better. They're bigger. You're, you're, still, you're still the champ in my book, Steve. Don't worry. Steve would like to sell his specimens. Jeff is set on adding them to his collection. And Aaron wants to slice them up. A meteoriticist perspective, the really interesting stuff is what's on the inside. Because that's where the story's read. When Aaron shines polarized light through thin slices of buzzard coolie meteorites, the chondrules light up like stained glass windows. 
Have you discovered anything new and exciting? I have, yeah. It's actually a very interesting sample. It gives us a complete picture from 4.56 billion years ago when the chondrules were forming to later where it came as a fireball. Valuable meteorites like those from Steve and Jeff form another piece of a cosmic jigsaw puzzle that scientists in labs and universities continue to research. While the work continues on Buzzard Cooley. John Duke here runs the Slowpoke Nuclear Reactor Lab. Why don't you give us a rundown on what we've been doing here with the Buzzard Cooley meteorite? What we have here is what's called a gamma ray spectrometer. And if Chris opens up the lead cave, and the cave there is just to uh, minimize background, what we're looking at is the radionuclides that are generated when the meteorite was in space. We can get an idea of the size of the meteorite when it uh, hit the atmosphere. We find meteorites and we often wonder, can we extrapolate how big the original mass was? And, and that's the work you're doing here. So it's fascinating for us. We were able to get a piece of the Buzzard Cooley meteorite within a week of it falling to the ground. And we were able to put them in the detector, just count what the radioactivity that's there and, and pick up things that, that last only for a, a few weeks at most. We'll remember that next time we recover a meteorite that's just fallen. We'll Absolutely. be straight over. Yeah, that's right, that'd be great. <laughs> In a way, you're trying to put a puzzle back together again. If you think about it, the, the ones that are closer to the surface of the rock in space will have more radiation because they're more exposed to cosmic radiation. It's something that was two meters in diameter, for example, the samples, if a sample came right from the center, would have very, very low level of activity compared with those on the edge of the meteorite. Have you been able to determine how big this was from the data? Or are you still crunching those numbers? We're still crunching the numbers. We're still working. It's still a work in progress. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. It's only $40,000. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> the guys asked Chris about a rare impact crater he's investigating. Yeah, that's his thing. So you find really small ones and big ones right on the rim of the crater. Right. When he offers the chance to see it in person, Steve and Jeff can't pack fast enough. He mentioned to us that it would be OK if we went to the White Court meteorite crater. We were just stunned. So we go, well, well OK, we're in Canada. Um, we found some buzzard cooling meteorites. Let's go to White Court. The White Court impact crater. It's protected by Canadian law. A chance to step inside it is enough to make any meteorite hunter's heart race. It was just discovered a couple of years ago, and it was really big news in the meteorite world. I have to teach this guy how to pack. We were under the impression that it was totally off limits. We're pretty jazzed to be on our way to see this thing that we'd only heard about. The guys make the two-hour drive from Edmonton to Whitecourt. The crater itself is hidden deep in the forest, where you'll find only hunters, loggers, and grizzly bears. The best way to get there? ATV. Let's get this unit activated. Steve and Jeff are led by the scientists they think of as the gatekeeper. Randy Kaufman spearheads the White Court Crater research. And he knows the crater better than anyone. Oh, yeah, watch out for bears. Damn it. Uh oh, where's Jeff? Hey, guys. Hey, Steve, I'm going to race you to the crater. <laughs> meteorites are one thing. Craters are the interaction between big meteorites and our planet. This is what they do to us. And there are only a handful of them that you can really revel in the experience of standing there and going, this is where it happened, and take it all in. Whoa! <laughs> a classic move, ladies and gentlemen. But notice how my metal detector never touched the ground. <laughs> I'm replaceable. My F-75 is not. It's one of only four in existence. And my biggest worry is I'm going to damage the detector, because this is a really sensitive piece of equipment. The F-75 is Jeff and Steve's secret weapon. Lightweight and extremely sensitive, this high-tech metal detector will be their only shot at finding iron meteorites today. But for now, the detectors have to be left behind. You cannot hunt in or near the crater. There is a $50,000 fine. 
Jeff hasn't seen the crater yet, but he faces a challenge just getting up to the rim. Oh, it's really slippery. <laughs> they enforce it. Can I be fined for damaging that tree? Woo! <laughs> and they should. There's nothing else like it in the I'm whole world. Sure. It's absolutely <laughs> amazing. A find here could lead to the most fantastic <laughs> discovery of their meteorite hunting careers. How cool is this? The White Court Crater, it's kind of the perfectly sized crater because it's big enough that you go, wow, a meteorite made this. It's big. The White Court Crater, 120 feet across and 20 feet deep. It's like a coffee cup. It remained undiscovered until just two years ago. There's a reason there's only a dozen craters in the world with the meteorites still there. Because the big ones totally disintegrate. You got this little range where it's big enough for a crater, but not quite big enough to destroy 100% of the rocks. That's the category we're in here. We've got signs all over protected site. $50,000 fine. But are we allowed to take ourselves down into the Absolutely. mouth of this fantastic feature? Look at him go. I, I've got no traction on these boots. They're so smooth. <laughs> Hey, my ballet training didn't really help with this. We get to see this incredible, beautiful meteorite crater that's so very well preserved and actually walk down inside it and stand there and go, God, this is where it happened. This is where the meteorite landed. I'm sorry, but I can't resist this. I can't resist this. I can't resist it. Wow. Right out of the sky, can you imagine? We are right in the bullseye. I'm usually not lost for words, and I just lay down on my back on the floor of the crater and just looked up. I just couldn't get over how great it was. Wow, can you imagine? This is exactly where it happened, out of the sky. It was an experience I will never forget. And then to be there, to be standing in it, it was just incredible. I can't even tell you how brilliant it was. It was such a great experience. Come on, get up. So how old is this thing? No, we have the maximum age through carbon dating of about 1,100 years. 1,100 years? Okay. Thick vegetation keeps the crater well hidden. In fact, you can't see the crater for the trees. It's pretty dense. So right now, I mean, you've come at a great time to actually see the crater because you can actually see the crater. For years, the local hunters and loggers knew there was a big hole in the woods. But it wasn't until 2007 when a couple of brothers went hunting with metal detectors. And when they found some pieces of iron shrapnel around the crater, they were like, oh, this, is, this could be very important. And then they brought it to our attention. Scientists first thought high resolution satellite images could pinpoint the crater, but there was no sign of it. No one knew it, but they were searching the wrong maps. The maps they needed were in the hands of loggers. LIDAR, or light detection and ranging maps. Loggers use LIDAR to map forests and measure growth. Flying LIDAR over the forest and bouncing laser light off the ground creates 3D images. And that's the scanner mirror. That's the webcam. It's really used a lot in forestry because you can fly an air aircraft with laser light bouncing from the aircraft to the ground, and you can map you know, where you want to log, but a certain amount of the laser light bounces off the ground surface. Scientists deleted the data the loggers were interested in, the trees, and for the first time, revealed just the ground and a perfectly formed crater. That's what really let us see White Court Crater. We haven't done any measurements out in the field of the depth or the width or anything. We just used the LIDAR data. The crater sits on land owned by the Canadian government, which acted quickly to create a protected zone, a box 200 meters by 200 meters. Taking any meteorites from here means jail time and a $50,000 fine. But just off the southeast corner is an area where no one has hunted before, and Randy is taking the guys right to it. I'm not aware that anybody's really searched down there yet, so we can go That's over there and <laughs> you can get the first shot. Let's go. Let's go now. <laughs> it would have been worth it just to come to see the crater and then get on the airplane and leave. Definitely. We got to go hunt. It's a once-in-a-lifetime chance to discover new and valuable meteorites. Come on, what's taking you so long? I'm getting on my battle armor. 
to do battle with the snow that is hiding those meteorites from me. A newly discovered impact crater, rare meteorites, virgin territory. It's a meteorite hunter's dream come true. Woo, this is great! We were so excited to see the crater, and then we were even more excited. Now we're going to get to hunt, and of course, you can't help think in the back of your mind, of course, we're going to find stuff, because they told us there's stuff to be found. And we're the meteorite men. Of course, we're going to find some. We get this great opportunity, and it's a long trek up on the ATVs. It was, it was like spooky. Oh, no! Jeff! What? My detector oh, broke. Oh, no. It scared me. It broke at the worst possible time, because finally, after all of this, we can hunt, and then that second he goes, oh, no, my detector's broken. It really was such a cruel thing, because there's nothing you can do. If you don't have a detector out there, you're out of luck. Let's have a look. He's a one-man equipment wrecking machine. We could splint the detector's broken limb. We've both kind of got this thing in our mind about how can we fix the problem with what we've got on hand? And look, we've got, we got duct tape, we've got plastic bags. Look, look, plastic, plastic knives and forks from our lunch supplies. What about, I think if you put a knife down here. Oh, oh yeah. That might work. That's actually a good idea. We made a splint. Does tape need to be kind of warm for the glue in it to work? Move your finger. What would we do without tape? Duct tape doesn't work. You just haven't used enough yet. Wow, instant metal detector repair. I'm very impressed. Well, let's see if it works. If their field repair doesn't work, Steve will have to sit out this once-in-a-lifetime hunt. Let's have a look. Hey, might still work. Cool. And it worked. We, we, we just lucked out. And then we go, well, now, finally, after all of this, we can hunt. OK, so here it is. We were allowed to hunt in very clearly defined areas. And this is a corner post, so essentially you can hunt outside of that. Okay. Oh. So yeah, you're, you're on the wrong side. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Safe. In danger. Safe. In Why danger. We... So you guys have some good hunting. I'm gonna go back and grab something to eat. It's the last day of the expedition, and there are only a few hours of daylight left. Hungry? After dark in these woods, okay. the hunters become the hunted. May the best man win. May the best meteorite man win. The white court meteorites the guys are hunting for are iron shrapnel. Like bits of a bomb casing, the valuable pieces were torn from the meteorite that blasted the crater in the Canadian forest. The impacting body shattered into thousands of fragments. That takes a lot of energy to destroy a piece of iron nickel that may have been the size of a desk or a refrigerator. <laughs> this detector is so sensitive, it's, it keeps picking up my boot. <laughs> we spent a lot of time hunting, and for a long time, we didn't find anything. This is insane. Try to hunt for meteorites in the snow. <sighs> hey, I got a target. Oh, that sounds promising. Steve, I got a target. I think we better dig that one. 10, 10 and 11. I like that ah sound, don't you? I want to get your expert pinpointing skills to work on this guy. Um, it's still in there. Oh, good. <laughs> Do you need a shovel? Oh, come on. It's a freaking washer. Why would there be a washer out here in the middle of nowhere? That sucks. It's extremely irritating and frustrating and disappointing. Thanks for nothing. You called me all the way over here I am here so sorry to interrupt your nap time. <sighs> and then you start going, well, are there actually any meteorites out here, or is it just junk? Well, the white court washer. It's a horrible experience. I don't recommend it. I work up a hunger, and I need some protein. He works up a hunger and wants to chew on some grass. I'm taking a break. It's um, lunchtime for civilized people. Me too. What are you eating? I don't know. Ground up animal parts is what that is. Mm-hmm. Sure. the worst bits. Mm -hmm. What are you eating? I'm eating a wonderful organic apple. No added chemicals and no animal parts. Mm. What do you think? 
I like them covered in caramel. <laughs> Whatever, I, you know, I, I mean, if that's what it takes to float his boat and get him going, that's fine. I just think it's kind of funny. Winter's coming, it's freezing cold. There's gonna be a blizzard any day and this will be under snow for the next six months. So it's do or die today. We, we just we just gotta find something. Got something over here. <laughs> that was amazing timing. Well, that sounds nice and loud. It does. White court meteorites are extremely rare. Oh man, that's sounding really good. Less than 40 pounds have ever been recovered. Try it again. Not a single white court meteorite has ever made it to market. Ooh. The first one Ooh. could start a record-setting bidding war. Okay, that should make it a little easier for you. Look at me moving an entire you would tree. You a great lumberjack. Thanks. I just don't really like the plaid shirts. It's not really my style. <laughs> Are you kidding me? This is a shoe. <laughs> What is a fossilized human shoe doing out here? Look, it's got a it's got a horseshoe on the bottom of the heel. No wonder you got a big signal from it. Well, that was a big disappointment. Crazy shoe. That sounds good. I got a target. Don't tell me it's the other shoe, Soul. My detector really went off. I got a fantastic yeah, signal. I thought, ah, it's probably another boot with a horseshoe nail to it. <sighs> Wanna test it for me? <laughs> this meteorite hunting work is for the birds. <sighs> oh, ah! Holy cow! That is definitely a meteorite. That oh is. my god! Wow! Way to go! <laughs> <laughs> My turn. <laughs> <laughs> That's my turn to hold it. Wow! What a cool shape. Look at that. It's a white court crater iron meteorite. Suddenly I feel a whole lot better. Isn't it funny the way that works? Well done. Thank you. Now it's my turn. <sighs> Did you bring lunch with you? I just brought some tea to celebrate. I thought a little cup of tea in the field after finding a white court crater iron meteorite would be appropriate. And you'll be pleased to know that it's not that awful tea that you drink, it's English breakfast. It's just the way things are done, Steve. Cheers. Oh, that smells so good. Ah. Ah, yes. That totally made my day. <laughs> ah. Jeff is a bona fide meteorite collector. Steve is in it for the money. And just after Jeff's find, Steve gets his first hit. Jeff! 50 feet away, maybe. No. And I went, wait, wait. That was nice. I was happy for him, but I hadn't found anything yet. So um, it, it sent me off. Come on. Ugh. Should be sticking to a magnet. There. Jeff! I got one! And I found my little six grammar. Check it out! Jeff! Woohoo! I, I traipsed up the hill and uh, around the corner, showed it to Jeff. Check it what out! What are you doing? It's a little guy. You found one already? Yeah. <laughs> we just found one. Oh, wow. Oh, that is such a shrapnel fragment. We're like little kids. We still get so excited about this. It's not as big as yours, but it's real. Wow, it is definitely real. Yay, one for one. We found two pieces. Yeah. OK, I got the GPS. Yeah. <laughs> that was so great. I haven't even finished marking the GPS on my find, and he just runs up over the hill like a bull. Look, I found one. Blah! I got to go mark the GPS. Blah! He's so crazy. These are $1,000 pieces we're finding. This is like cool. Just when the hunt starts to really pay off, the sun begins to set. They make one last push. What you got there? I don't know. This rock comes out 
on my magnet. What? It is shrapnel. I, I mean, it came from the piece. It's definitely a meteorite. That's totally different. It is. This find doesn't look like the sharp-edged shrapnel they expect. Yeah. Steve and oh, Jeff are baffled. What is... Look how prepared you are. Your little blue towels for them to keep them warm. It's got a little bit of on a little bit of shrapnel-like markings there on that side, but this is so rounded. My theory is, is that it, it was a piece of the outside of the meteorite that did get melted a little bit, was rounded. It got ripped off. That's amazing. Find number three weighs in at 150 grams and could fetch $20 a gram. That puts a $3,000 price tag on it, if they can get an export permit. According to What's been found here, it's a big one. It's in the top 5% or so. Fantastic, good one, good one. Wow, that was just, that's just really cool. Time is running out and they have to clear out of the site. Hey, Steve. Oh, that sounds really good. Ah, what is that? Oh, uh, well, we must have, we, we've moved it. There, there, there. Holy <gasps> cow. <laughs> That's a meteorite. <sighs> wow. That is amazing. It's like a claw. That is so torn up. That's actually one of the larger pieces that's been found at the crater. We ended up significantly increasing the total known weight of all of the pieces that have been found. It was astonishing. At, at twenty dollars a gram, you're looking at a five thousand dollar meteorite that just came out of the ground. That's that's that big, but we're not allowed to take it out of the country without an export permit. We can't just put them in the bag and take them home. The guys race them back to the University of Alberta to show Dr. Chris Hurd. This was perhaps the most exciting one. Oh, look at that! Wow. See, you can really look at how sharp those edges okay. are. You can really see how how shrapnel-like it is, like, like the meteorite just ripped itself apart and you've pulled these pieces that are of the metal apart. It's really like what bomb shrapnel looks like. Yeah, indeed. At the end of the day, they recovered four meteorites worth a total of about $10,000, if Jeff decides to sell some. Sometimes you find something that's just too nice to sell. It goes into the collection, that's fine. It was so taxing. I can't wait to sell them. <laughs> uh, 